I'd now like to recognize our first witness, Representative Warren Davidson from the Buckeye State. Thank you for taking time to share your views with the Budget Committee. The committee has received your written statement. It will be part of the formal hearing record, and you'll have five minutes to deliver your remarks, give or take, uh, given our short turnout here today. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Representative Davidson. Chairman, thank you, and to the committee, thank you for taking up this uh, time uh, in your committee's schedule to hear from other members, and I appreciate your uh, interest in uh, the CBO Show Your Work Act, H.R. Uh, 3822. Uh, this, this, uh, this is a bill that uh, deals not with uh, pejorative accusations or ad hominem attacks on CBO. It simply says, whatever you're doing, please show your work. Uh, it could be PhD level algorithms or a magic eight ball, but whatever they do, they could show it uh, to the world. Uh, the goal is to strengthen the transparency and therefore accountability and in the long run accuracy because they would benefit from the same sorts of open source methods that are popularized throughout the for-profit economy. Uh, before coming to Congress, I was a manufacturer. Whenever our company was deciding how to price for a quote or a new product line or how to value an acquisition, I always worked closely with our CFO and our cost accountants. Our interactions were iterative as we worked to model the critical decisions that shaped our companies. At times, a quick summary report, a chart, graph, or a simple email was sufficient. But I could always get as much detail as needed to understand how the costs stacked up so that I could accurately assess how the various alternative courses of action could influence the desired outcome. This open and transparent relationship helped my executive team communicate effectively and my businesses run more efficiently. I was able to execute transactions knowing I had the best data. No section or department within the business held the other hostage. Congress and indeed the American people need the same relationship with CBO. CBO has the vital role as our accounting department in Congress. Given the enormous weight CBO scores have uh, on the ability of members of Congress to make policy decisions, it should be a top priority for CBO standards and scores to be transparent, accurate, and of the highest possible quality. Requiring CBO to release how it scores legislation for informational purposes can help lawmakers fairly judge these bills effectively and accurately model alternative courses of action. I didn't have to guess in business and when the stakes are even higher here in Congress, we shouldn't hope, we should know. For that reason, last September, I introduced H.R. 3822, the CBO Show Your Work Act. The bill does three things. First, the CBO, it requires the CBO to publish all data, models, and processes utilized in the analysis and scoring of legislation online. Next, it specifies that the data and information provided must be sufficient so that individuals outside of CBO can understand, replicate, and reproduce the results found within CBO scores. Finally, should CBO not disclose certain data sets due to privacy, they must instead publish a complete list of data variables for that data. This would give users of the model an opportunity to modify inputs using aggregates based on private details uh, kept at CBO. So for example, you could have the sum but not the individual components say of tax returns or prescription drug costs. Data such as these descriptive statistics, averages, standard deviations, or, or correlations could include reference to the statute uh, or rule preventing their disclosure. In considering this bill, it's important to remember that academic institutions around the world already do this. Economists understand that transparency and openness of communication provides a strong safeguard against errors, omissions, and bias. This is why the academic community increasingly requires scholars and economists to show their work before publishing to ensure the integrity is upheld in, of the published work. In one example, the American Economic Association uh, data availability policy reads, quote, it is the policy of the American Economic Association to publish papers only if the data used in the analysis are clearly and precisely documented and are readily available to any researcher for purposes of replication. In light of most recent glaring need for transparency concerning the increasingly contentious healthcare and tax reform debates, 
It's vitally important that CBO adopts this widely accepted and acknowledged data availability standard so that members can do our job and that we have access to our accounting department and we have access to expertise that may not even be available on Capitol Hill. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Davidson. Uh, again, uh, pursuant to the rules of the uh, committee hearing, five minutes each side for questions. I'll yield to the uh, ranking member. I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Are there any questions uh, on the majority side? Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, Mr. Davidson, I, I was struck by what the ranking member said, that here is an important issue. We all talk about CBO a great deal, yet only three members have come forward to try to, to, try to make a difference uh, in that. I think it, that is, is partly because of a confidence that we all like to have in the men and women who, who work with us in service. I think part of it is because it is so complex. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, replicating the CBO's uh, uh, work, uh, I, I believe as we've had some hearings, Mr. Chairman, folks have said, you know what, we really can't be a check and a balance on CBO because we don't have their model, we don't have their capability, we can't go back and replicate it. On the one hand, I would, I would uh, imagine that if we could replicate CBO's work, there might be more gaming of the of the system. You and I would sit down with CBO's model and we would work our bill out so that it came back with a favorable uh, score based on that model. My, I guess my question is when I, when I go to the private sector and look at some of the big macroeconomic modeling houses, they tell me that their formula is the most proprietary thing that they have. They want to keep that a secret. In fact, we had a bill uh, on Wall, about Wall Street the other day where stock pickers wanted to keep their, their formulas for picking stocks a, a, a secret in that way. Uh, given your experience uh, in, the, in the private sector, you would distinguish the work that CBO does uh, and its need for, a, for public transparency from the work that all of those private sector groups do and their desire for secrecy. Absolutely. So if you think about a trading firm, they're literally rewriting code all day to, uh, to get the right algorithm to trade. If you think about uh, you know, Google, they're, they're writing stuff all day to get search results. Uh, if you're looking at people that do this, they have proprietary information. In this case, uh, the information is the American people's information. This is our accounting department, and uh, you know, it, it, their, their formulas shouldn't be proprietary. So if you think about a spreadsheet or a pivot table that they're, they're looking at, it, there may be proprietary information that's contained on other, other sheets, but the top level data, the formula that, that says this is how, um, you know, how many people are affected by this change of policy, uh, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's an equation of some sorts. There's math behind it normally. And uh, so we should be able to say, gee, what are the variables that are driving that? If you think about a company like GE, they're undergoing some restructuring. Uh, I, I would assume the board of directors right now is asking lots of questions about the cost accounting in these various di uh, divisions of the company, saying how are we going to save our company? Uh, and I, I am confident they're not being told by their accounting department, well, we can't really share that with you. And uh, you know, essentially, we are here trying to steer the course of fiscal policy for the United States economy, far more consequential than any one company. And uh, we're doing it you know, blindly, frankly. We just throw stuff in and go, well, gee, I hope this gets a good score. And, uh, and then how dare you question the integrity of the accounting department? Well, gee, what would you base your assumption on? I mean, could you show me? Uh, maybe I would understand why if I dry, you know, make this recommendation, we're getting the outcome here. And it may be that you're exactly right, but then legislators could write effective legislation and not be shooting in the dark. You would anticipate, if your bill became law, that I would be able to grab some group of, of, uh, of, of, of data or a, a program or something and take it down to Georgia State University, and we would be able to uh, run the same model with the same uh, variables on the same formula and come out with the same outcome. When you talk about show your work, you mean we really ought to be able to replicate the work that today goes on behind closed right, doors. Right, it should be reproducible, just the same as the standard for academic research and same when you're looking at crowdsourcing a project. If they're looking at uh, open source code, uh, it's available and it's out there. You should be able to put the inputs in and people would say, gee, what about this idea? You may actually get even better ideas from the great American public and uh, other minds that are focused on other problems. Well, I, I agree with Mr. Yarmouth that we ought to be proud of the men and women who service in all the different ways that they, that they do. 
uh, and I w would wonder if anyone would have an objection uh, to being able to replicate uh, that work because whatever cloud of suspicion hangs over that work today, uh, your idea uh, would dispel that cloud uh, forever, and I'm grateful to you for it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Okay. Um, given the fact that we have five minutes each side, I'd seek unanimous consent to extend the time just a little bit longer because we do have a couple of more members that had a question. Uh, and without objection, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, just be mindful of the fact that we are uh, supposed to be on the clock. Uh, Mr. Ferguson. Dale. Mr. Davidson, thank you so much, and uh, you too, Mr. Perry. Glad y'all are here. Uh, one, one of the concerns that I've had, <coughs> or one of the questions that I've had, and, and just keep going back to, is looking at the accuracy of the data in a, in, within a 10-year window. Go and pick any, any year in which you have a CBO score and then extrapolate out 10 years and what's the accuracy of that data at that 10 year window. What we have found, what we've been told by CBO is that they are 97, I think, percent accurate um, within six years, but they do not have any data to support years seven, eight, nine, and 10. And we're being asked to make long-term decisions on data which we have no idea what the accuracy of that data or the likelihood of those things coming true is at the 10 year mark. Would you ever in your business models look at, you know, try to try to look 10 years out and say, well, we really have no idea what, what, that, what that could actually look like and, 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 and cost our company. And do you have any suggestions about, you know, what, what you would do with that? With, with that, that, lack of, that lack of certainty in the outlying years as we make really critical decisions based on data that we that we that's unclear what what the long-term outlook is yeah, i think you know rearward looking is uh is a little easier than forward looking right so when you look back uh, on anything it's hard to know exactly how things are going to turn out in uh, six to ten years or sometimes six to ten months uh, but but you can look at what the assumptions were and why you drew that conclusion if you have access to the models and so that's my hope is that we would get more accurate models if there was transparency. And as Mr. Woodall stated, um, it would be the surest remedy to all the um, partisan accusations that, well, this is biased because of this assumption. Look, it's math. Here's the formula. This is the assumptions. And if you disagree, then at least you would know why. So it may be that some people, for example, in tax modeling, uh, the whole debate about how much um, revenue does the government collect comes down to what your assumption on the growth rate is. Well, what's driving the assumptions on that? Uh, I think a lot of us looked at the CBO report and talked to some outside people that had more optimistic assumptions than CBO did. But we didn't have the model to go off of. We just had people uh, hoping that they were accurate. We could look at outside models and say why their assumptions were what they were, but we couldn't and still haven't been able to look at what CBO's model was. All right, Ms. Black, Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Representative Davidson, for being here. I, um, like you, would like to see the information and how they got to where they got to. And I think when you're in a business, at least my experience in business, it's a lot easier um, to be able to make some of those assumptions that are being made, because it really is just about numbers in many of those cases. The thing that I think is so, so difficult, and I wanted to ask you if you have a recommendation or if you've looked at other models that do a better job with this, are the behavioral assumptions. That's been my biggest complaint with CBO, is they make an assumption on how someone is gonna behave. We saw that particularly in the case of the Affordable Care Act. Um, if you do this, then we think people are gonna react this way and do that. I, I don't know that there's a good model out there. Do you know, is there a good model out there? Is there some um, other, uh, scoring agency that you've looked at where you said, I really like that behavioral assumption model and I think they do a really good job on that. Uh, yes, I, th I think if you look at, uh, say for example, a large retail store like, like Walmart, how do they run their inventory? How is it that they know that if the storm models uh, predict this, we should stock these items on their shelf? They've got great data. They'll, they'll have reasonably accurate projections off you know, how many Pop-Tarts they're gonna sell uh, in a storm versus how many Pop-Tarts they're gonna sell in good weather and you know, uh, when they need to have uh, stock. So they understand that because it's the specifics of their business, but they really look at it differently by different regions. And so I'm not saying that we can use their exact model to drop in on health insurance, but they are very familiar with their model. CBO may very well be incredibly familiar with our model, 
but as the people making the decisions, uh, it's guarded, it's veiled. We still don't know why they assume that no matter what we do, the same number of people lose coverage on the health care plan. That would be nice to see the model, and then we could see, well, I don't know, I model different behavior. Uh, now you can say I believe there's different behavior than the CBO believes, but that's, that's all uh, qualitative. What we'd like to be able to do is make it quantitative with a real model. Have you seen any other models out there that you can point to to say um, this particular model uh, got things right, got it closer? Because I've not seen any of that. Well, at the macroeconomic level, I mean, economists uh, exist to make weathermen look accurate, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, thank you. I yield back. All right. Mr. Yarmouth. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in another day, we're going to start a process. Mr. Woodall is part of it. Uh, Chairman Womack and I are part of it, uh, a bicameral, bipartisan effort to analyze the budgeting and appropriations process and see if there are solutions we can come up to whatever problems we, we perceive. And you know, I, I would think that your proposal would be something that uh, this group might want to consider. My question about it is, and, and part of it relates to what uh, former Chair Chairman Black mentioned, but when you listen to CBO here, and we've had three hearings, and they've spent a lot of time talking about the components of their uh, analysis. And when you listen to them, it actually seems like there is more subjective, um, artistic modeling than there is actual data. And so much of it has to do with, with human behavior. Uh, we know that, for instance, with the ACA, all the anticipation was that a lot of companies would decide it was in their economic interest to pay the uh, $2,000 per employee rather than continuing to provide coverage, and very few companies did that because they made the judgment that it was more important to, um, to retain their workers, to treat their workers well, their employees well, and that th that's something that no model, I think, could have anticipated. And in fact, uh, I don't think any outside uh, a analysis of the ACA anticipated that so few companies would actually make that decision. So that's one point I want to make, but my question to you is, if we were to have all this information, knowing Congress as I think I do in my now in my 12th year, what do you think Congress would make of it if they had all of this information? And what would be the repercussions if you or 10 members or 50 members came and said, we're convinced that this modeling was wrong, that this process was wrong, this methodology was wrong. What would be the repercussions of that if, if we had your, your suggestions in place? Well, I think, you know, so you, you make the point that how much of it is qualitative versus quantitative. And I think that's one of the concerns, frankly, that, that uh, we rely a lot on qualitative data. And you've got companies out there in the private sector uh, where, you know, quant folks, high caliber math folks, are some of the highest demand. I mean, you have PhDs in math signing for million, is a million dollar initial jobs uh, because math is so important to their business. They're not hoping on some qualitative assumptions. They're building great data sets and using math. I'm not saying CBO can pay those, but it may be, we're, we're making, we have companies making million dollar decisions with better better support than we're making trillion dollar decisions. And if it were working really well, I suppose I wouldn't be as concerned, but if you just back in and macro, take all the politics away, look at the math, think of all the assumptions we have to have going for us to believe that we're somehow going to collect a trillion dollars extra revenue. Because we're borrowing a trillion dollars, we assume, I su somehow I assume some people that vote for this stuff uh, believe that in the long run we're going to be able to afford it. Um, if you're just doing qualitative decisions, maybe it's okay to keep doing that. We've got to get more quant in our, mo in our accounting department. And if they do have it, I think that making it public might even drive behavior where it becomes uh, common for members of Congress to have a quant person in their office. I would be looking at that. I mean, I had one of the most important hires that we had in our company was cost accounting because we were pricing stuff. Uh, you know, the fate of the company hangs out sometimes on a tenth of a penny. 
in terms of pricing it. You can't guess at that. You have to be, you know, qu quantitatively accurate. And I think sometimes when we're, we're modeling these things that are incredibly consequential for the entire economy in the United States, but have really big inf impact on the global economy. And so I really believe that we, we are way behind what is happening in the private sector with respect to quantitative data. Well, I, I, my, you didn't answer the one question I had was, if Congress had all this data and you have a, n a number of members who say, well, this is wrong, they shouldn't have done it this way, what happens at that point? Well, this is common in a, in a business as well, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, this, this person might believe that, no, this is the right course of action, but they're supporting it with data. Uh, and generally, some people are persuaded more by emotion and qualitative uh, reasoning, uh, and that might be the right answer sometimes, uh, but, but facts matter. They're stubborn, and when you have quantitative data and it's supported by, um, you know, sound logic and math, uh, a lot of people are persuaded by that. Now, we would have our debate. We would still have our privileges as a member of Congress. We would make our arguments. But I think we would have the supporting documents. And then, you know, as, as is the case, we would probably have Brookings look at the data and believe that it's this way and have Heritage look at it and it's that way. It may still have the same kinds of debates, but I think the quality of our debate would be better because it would be based on mathematical models more more and more frequently, and we would get more and more accurate, just as we've seen the private sector do. All right. Mr. Chairman, may, may I just ask if you would yield on just the end of that question, because it was a very interesting sure. question. Um, Representative Davison, what would then happen at the end of the day? Because you would obviously have a number of people say, I think it's more the way Brookings, or I think it's more this one, or that one, whichever one you choose. But at the end of the day, would we still use CBO? as what we would use well, my as bill doesn't a Congress? Uh, th thank you. Um, and so my bill doesn't say whether we should or shouldn't have CBO. I, I think it would be hard to imagine not operating with some kind of accounting department. Um, but but uh, so I think we should have someone exactly what the org chart should look like. I'll leave that to, to those of you who've been spending a lot of time working with them. I, I'm just looking at it and saying, even if, even if we had the debate, as Mr. Yarmouth laid out, at the end of the day, we would make a decision, whether it was based off of uh, qualitative data or quantitative data or this person's model or that one. We would decide. And then, as, as Mr. Ferguson pointed out, over time, we would see the results, and we would know who was accurate. I mean, we're, we're in the early stages of that experiment today. It was, you know, five alarm fire, Armageddon, crumbs on the tax plan. And over the course of the next year or two or five, we will see whether it really is going to have a stimulative effect on the economy and people are really going to get more take-home pay, um, as, as, uh, as has been the case, or whether, whether it's really just a, a ripoff of the middle class. People are already starting to see that in their paychecks. We made the decision based off of something, but time will tell. And I think that's going to continue to be the case even if we do um, have the back and forth between uh, a higher level of data. Thank you. I just think the ranking member brought up something I hadn't thought about. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, good, healthy discussion. Thank you, uh, Representative Davison, for your comments uh, and your uh, 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 desire to uh, seek improvement in our process and your willingness to take questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman.